Hello, everyone. So I was the chap who was heckling earlier, so please heckle me. Um, but no, in all seriousness, this is... Not just yet. In all seriousness, this is a, a, a dry run for a talk I'm giving at Cloud Native Con in a couple of weeks' time. So you're my guinea pigs. If there's anything that's not clear or you think I'm wrong, um, then, then just you know, stick your hand up or shout out. So we'll, we'll get started with the usual hands up. Uh, who here is using Prometheus? Oh, OK. I was hoping for a few more. Um, I'm one of the Prometheus developers, so. Who here is using Kubernetes? More people, OK, good. Good. Um, so a little bit about myself. This is boring. I've just started a startup called Causal, where I'm working on Prometheus. Uh, before that, I worked for a company called Weaveworks, which does a lot of Go, Go programming. Before that, Google. Before that, a company called Akuna. And this is my stock photo. Um, this is the only one that's allowed on the internet. And if you see a different one, then it must be taken down. <laughs> it's, it's me. <laughs> anyway, so the talk will be a quick introduction, and then we'll go into the red method. Uh, we'll also talk about the use method and something called the four golden signals. Um, and this will all become obvious. So why am I giving this talk? So other than a practice, um, there's a conference, a Prometheus conference that runs every year. This year it was in Munich. Um, and it's talks by Prometheus developers and Prometheus users. And generally, it's a big like, explaining of what Prometheus does and what the users use it for. And we all come together and decide what we're going to do for the next year. And at this conference, this thing called the Red Method kept getting talked about. Uh, but no one was explaining it. And I felt a bit guilty, because I kind of came up with the Red Method. Um, and it's really tongue in cheek. Like, it's not meant to be a serious thing. Um, I came up with it because I needed a way of explaining what I was doing. Um, people were telling me to use the use method, and it wasn't what I wanted to do. And so I needed a catchy title. Um, so I came up with this thing called the red method. Although, like, you'll, as you'll see from this talk, I didn't really invent anything. But, but more importantly, why am I talking about instrumentation and monitoring, and why is this even remotely like something you should care about? So if you're doing software development and you're running a service, you need to know how that service is behaving. Right? This is pretty obvious, right? A lot of people do that through logging right now, which is great and works very well. And I'm here to kind of say you should probably use monitoring. And you should probably use metrics. And because it's a lot cheaper than using logging. And that's basically it. When you come along and say we should use monitoring, people start asking, well, what should I monitor and what should I instrument? And it really helps, especially if you're a developer, not an operator, to kind of say, look, here's just a pattern. Just do that. You don't really have to think about it. It's been accepted. Just do that pattern. And it, it really covers the kind of unknown unknowns. When you don't know what to do, you just kind of just follow that pattern. And you trust that somebody else has thought about it. I, there's a whole bunch of debates in this uh, environment about what the best practices are. And I'm going to skip all of them and just focus on the red method. Um, and all of my examples in this talk will be Prometheus and Kubernetes, because that's what I use, and that's what I work on. Um, so that's why I asked those questions earlier. So without further ado, let's, uh, let's get on. Can I just, just pull this table out a bit more? I like to wander around the stage a bit. How's that working? Good. So what is the red method? The red method is three things, hence three letters. First, what should you monitor? First, we're looking at services here. We're not looking at hardware. We're not looking at anything else. We're looking at services. Treat each microservice and expose the rate of requests that that service is getting. Pretty, it's pretty simple, right? Expose the number of errors that that service is, is throwing or, or the number of responses in error to those requests. And then expose the duration that each request is taking, how long each it takes to process each request, right? This is really simple. And, and, and like the obvious things, like this only works for request-driven services. If you've got a batch-oriented pipeline, don't use this. Or you use something similar, but maybe not this. The name comes actually from the use method. Um, a chap, when I was at Weaveworks, a chap was like, what's our monitoring strategy? And I was like, we don't have a monitoring strategy. He's like, you should use the use method. And, and the minute I heard that kind of, the hairs on the back of my head, oh, no, I'm definitely not doing any kind of method. Um, so I came up with my own instead. Um, this was in, in, in December 2015. I, I picked this, album, uh, th these, uh, this acronym. And as you can tell, it doesn't quite fit. Right? It just, it's just a bit awkward, but it seems to have stuck. Um, this was actually the, the talk 
where I gave it. I had different hair back then. This is one of the photos that needs to be expunged from the internet. Um, but yeah, this was actually not what I said. I didn't say you should use mine over Brendan's. Um, and, and Brendan got really annoyed about this. Um, but, but his stuff, as we'll talk about later, is, is exceptionally well thought through and is really useful just for a different set of things. Anyway, back to this. So why should you do a consistent, a consistent monitoring, consistent instrumentation? Well, I spent two years at Google um, looking after Google Analytics. I was um, the manager for the SRE team. Um, and what that meant is I had to be on call for code I hadn't written. And that scared me quite a lot. Um, but it turns out it's really important to the business to be able to put people on call for things that they haven't written. Because if, if you can only put people on call for things that they've written themselves, you can't really scale the business. Like, and, and you've got to assume you need things like 24-7 support, and people don't really do very well if they have to be awake for 24 hours. So, so they had a bunch of techniques for dealing with how do I put someone on call for something they've not written. And one of them was by making all of the monitoring and the instrumentation across all of the services pretty consistent. So this is why you need a consistent monitoring like philosophy, if you like, for your services, because this will allow someone else to take the pager for them, and that's what you want. Right, it also means the, these three things have been chosen specifically, not by me, mainly by Google, and we'll cover that later. Um, these three things have been chosen specifically because they're very customer focused and they're very SLA driven. You should be deciding with your, your business owners, with your product owners, with your customers, what is an appropriate SLA. You know, if you actually have to go and sign a contract with them that says, we will respond to your requests within 100 milliseconds, then you should friggin' monitor that. And that's what the duration bit means. Like, if you have to go and sign a contract with them saying, we will ingest your log events or your metric events or, or your, your card processing somethings, um, you know, and we will only fail 0.1% of the time, that's your SLA and you should monitor that and you should alert on that. So this is why this is important, consistency, being user-focused, and we should all care about the users of our software. We should. So, we've done that. Now onto the actual code. This is how you would do this in Prometheus. I'm gonna give you all five minutes to read this. But no, I'm not. Um, the, it, it's basically dead simple. You declare this thing called a metric. It's a piece of code with some, def with some definitions about what it does. You register it. Then, when you actually want to handle a request, you Typically, you'd call the, I don't have a laser pointer, but typically you'd call this thing here, observe. Um, and so I've, I've kind of wrapped this up in a piece of middleware, which you can wrap requests with. This is a really standard kind of pattern. Um, the other thing I want to point out here is there's this library called HTTP snoop, which is awesome. Um, and it basically gives you a response writer that does all sorts of instrumentation, and you should use this in your middleware. And they've thought a lot about the performance of it, and it's, it works really well. So basically, all this does is it wraps the handler you want to run in another handler that passes in a kind of mocked um, response writer, captures a bunch of metrics, and then tells Prometheus about them. Really simple. The other thing is Prometheus is a pool-based metric system, if you don't know about this. What this means is Prometheus uses service discovery to reach out to your services and gather metrics from them, which means you need to expose metrics. And that's this line here. This is saying, Prometheus expose your metrics, uh, sorry, the Prometheus client libraries expose their metrics at the slash metrics path on the HTTP server. Really simple, right? No questions so far. So, more kind of pseudo code. Well, this is actually real code. This is PromQL. One of the nice things about the method I gave you before, just exposing that single metric, is that it actually covers the entire red method. What this means is, that, that single histogram was the thing we were exposing. So this histogram in Prometheus is a set of buckets that say, you know, how many requests were less than 10 milliseconds, how many were less than 20, how many were less than 40, how many were less than 80. I made those numbers up, but you get the kind of idea. So from that set of data, you can actually infer what's the request rate, because one of the buckets is the count of requests. You can uh, infer what the error rate is, and this is uh, by virtue of the way we did the labels in the previous slide and we can infer what the duration or a distribution. So this is uh, the 99th percentile duration of those requests. So let's do a demo with one hand. This is gonna be fun. If 
Right then, um, this is actually my, no, in a second. This is what I do for a living, which is causal is a hosted version of Prometheus. But I, I'm, um, yeah? Yes, maybe. The question was, can I change my display settings? <laughs> Scaled 1080i, there we go. I'm always accused of not uh, repeating the question. So. Oh, but now my windows are too small, or big. OK, so, so here we go. Let's see how this works. There we go, good. <laughs> right, is anyone recording this? Oh, you're s did I make enough hints? Yeah. <laughs> Eventually. Right then, so I'm, I'm not going to use the, um, uh, the, my product, because I think that's dishonest. Um, and instead, I'm going to show you the Prometheus UI. And so this is monitoring our live system. And so I can give you some examples. We can go, uh, we have a thing called request duration seconds count. No, nope, I can type. And I'm going to say, I'm only going to go for dev because I don't want to expose any company secrets about what real QPS we're doing. So our front end. And this will tell us what our front end's doing. So you can see our dev front end is giving some very large and strange numbers, which is a bit strange. But then you realize what we've got is this count metric on the end. So what Prometheus exposes are counters, like monotonically increasing values. And Prometheus exposes the raw values and then relies on like the Prometheus query language to actually like differentiate them and give you a rate, for instance. So let's do that. Let's differentiate them. We can go, I'm going to use irate because it's cooler. Um, and you have to tell it over what period. So here we go. Now this looks a bit more interesting. We've got the kind of rates you're getting. But we've got all of these things because they're broken down by these labels that Prometheus supports. And so I've, I've included the label, well, what job is this coming from? What instance of what job this is coming from? Um, the method we're using, the namespace it's running in, the route, with route, sorry, practicing for an American audience. Um, the route this is coming from, um, so you can see I'm actually talking to the admin Prometheus right now, um, and whether it failed or succeeded and whether it was a streaming call. So we don't really care about that, so we'll just sum them all together. Okay, so we can see we're doing about 43 QPS to our, our um, dev environment, and we can, of course, plot that on a graph. So there you go. That's, that's the R of the red method. So now I want to know the error rate. You're doing a very good job. Um, so what I'm going to go, I said we had this status code uh, field. I'm going to say status code now. My status codes are HTTP status codes. I um, have had too many beers to remember. The, no, it's this way, I think. I think that might work. And I'm going to regex them against 200. And I'm going to do this correctly. So I'm going to say anything that doesn't match this regex of two dot dot is an error, which is kind of saying anything that's not a two XX, if you like, is an error. And there you go. There were some errors recently. Hopefully no one's copied the URL out of the URL bar or anything. And so we can even do things like see that as a proportion of the total request. Because you, you should never view your absolute number, your absolute error rate. Because that's kind of useless. Like, how do I know if three errors a second is my service is down or it's 0.1%? So let's divide that by the whole thing. This is where copy and paste is useful. And um, we'll just get rid of this. And so now we can see the error as a proportion. So that didn't work. Yeah, I mean, this is a question of like, you should really put some load on your test environment. So one of the, I mean, here, this load is all self-imposed. We send our own metrics to ourselves. Um, but I've seen people do, like, some 1% of production load get sent to dev and things like that. I mean, that's a problem. You should have load on your dev environment, because if you don't, it's not representative of production. Um, so why didn't that work, though? Oh, maybe M means milli. That's what I'm going to go with. So anyway. Um, now we want to show, so we've done, we've done request rate, we've done error rate, now we need to do no latency. So uh, this is the hardest function in the world to type um, without copying it out of your uh, text, but I'm going to try and do it. So histogram quantile, and we're going to go for the 99th percentile, and then we need a sum and a rate, and I'll explain what this all does in a second. Uh, a sum and a rate, and then we need request duration seconds count. Nope. Bucket. And so these are those buckets that I was talking about earlier. I assume it's bucket. I hope it's bucket. And we'll go again. We'll go for dev. So we'll go um, job equals dev. So 
and turned and and we'll go we'll take it over the last minute and then we need to the there's a special uh, label which is called le which means less than or equal um and that describes the bucket so we're just gonna break up our sum rate by that and fingers crossed it works yes that's the only time i've got that right so this is in seconds, and you can see our dev latency is actually not too bad. So it's about, you know, 99% of our latency is about 40 milliseconds on its peaks. So there you go. That's the red method with Prometheus. Super simple snippet of code. Maybe more code than I'd like, but you've got to bear in mind most of that's reusable. And then the set of queries you need to do to run this, really simple. And of course, if you do want to use our UI, it's all completely automated because we're awesome. And so you just come along and you press uh, this bucket button here. And it should all work. I'm going to blame the, uh, the, uh, the Wi-Fi being really slow. Um, and there you go. There's the same query. It looks completely different. <laughs> so thank you very much. So let me. There used to be a feature in Keynote where when you presented, it would stop mirroring. Did I imagine that? <laughs> I think so, yeah. This used to be much easier, I swear. Okay, that was the red method demoed with Prometheus. That's running on our Kubernetes cluster, so that's why you had those kind of uh, default slash, because default was the namespace. So now we're going to talk about um, how this is actually a, maybe a little bit more useful in a microservice environment. You know, your microservice environment, you know, let's say they all look like this, right? Uh, maybe with a few hundred more services, but there's some graph of services. Hopefully it's directive. Um, hopefully it's Ace of Silica, I think is what the aim is. Anyway, there's some graph. How do you use the red method to kind of isolate the service that's throwing the error in this graph? Which is really what you want to do. Your, res your responsibility as like the on-call, the first responder, is to find the service that's causing the problems, and then either you know, go and look at the playbook, figure out what you do about that, or escalate to the developer who wrote it. Hopefully there's a playbook. Well, so what, we, what, what I advise and what I've practiced is to, write, is to kind of um, breadth first traverse this graph. So treat it as a tree, sit there, go through it um, layer by layer, and, and build this into rows in a dashboard. So this is Grafana. We've probably all seen Grafana. Each one of these rows is, uh, this is running hopefully on my dev environment. Yes, that's a low enough QPS that it's my dev environment. Um, each one of these rows is a service, and then you know we've got the front end service, and then we've got various other services in what I do that do various things. But we just traverse them depth first, the left, I have QPS, and I break that down by error rate. And as you can see, there's no errors. And on the right, I have latency. And so this is my kind of my red method graphs. Um, I really like this method because it really makes it very easy. You kind of just scroll down until you see the errors stop, and that's the service that's causing the errors. Um, a company called Vivid Cortex, who I, I assume they do monitoring, has started blogging about this. And they've ca they called it hierarchical observability, which, which I guess is a good thing. Um, but yeah, um, that's kind of cool. I like that. The other thing is, you probably, zooming in on one of the graphs on the right here, you've noticed I've included average. Now, if anyone's ever been to a talk about SLA monitoring, you know that you don't use averages, right? Averages are the devil. Um, I use averages for two very good reasons. One, you can't actually sum latencies. Right? You can't say, like, I've got a really high latency here. And then the two services that I'm talking about, I'm talking to, which kind of make up that latency, they can be really, really small, right? Because the way latencies work, and the way sorry, percentiles, not latencies, the way percentiles work is it, it's very feasible that you have two services you're talking to with very low latency, but your latency is very high. So this is why you include averages, because averages you can sum. Like if your average latency is high, then one of those services below you is going to have a high average latency. The other reason is we talked about this bucketing system in Prometheus for building these uh, percentiles. Um, the bucketing system's not perfect. You either use the default built-in buckets, or most people tune them to, to be specific to the service they're monitoring with some kind of expectation about what the latency will be. And if you get it wrong, you can have the latency report really low and the average report, like the 99th latency report really low and the average report really high. Um, so it's useful to have the average in there to indicate when you've got the bucketing wrong. OK, that's pretty much it on the red method. There's a whole bunch of, I mean, this is the thing that's been crazy. Like, I came up with this kind of on the cuff. It was a bit sarcastic. And loads of people, well, the first two are me, but 
four other people have written about this. One of them twice. Um, and I think Matt was saying, like, at, at .go in, uh, in London, someone else, uh, in, in Paris, someone else mentioned this. So it keeps getting mentioned, and this is one of the reasons I wanted to kind of give this talk. Um, these, these are really good uh, talks to read. Um, and, and the second one is the one I wrote, so I would read that as well. Anyway, so let's move on. The use method. This is the thing that inspired the red method, or rather the kind of, you know, it's got to be three letters. It's got to say method afterwards. Um, if you Google use images, that's the image you get. Um, I like to include images. So what is the use method? Well, the use method is for every resource, for every physical or virtual resource, you should monitor the utilization, which means the percent of time it was doing something. The saturation, I'm just reading off the slides here. This is terrible at practice. Uh, saturation, which is just how much work did it have to do? So you'll see these are kind of related but subtle. Um, and errors, the count of the number of errors that came from that. The difference between utilization and saturation is kind of the key to this, as far as I can tell. Um, utilization is how much work it had to do, right? Uh, sorry, how much work it did. And saturation is how much work it had to do. So for instance, it's very, uh, very possible that it was 100% busy, but it actually had like a massive backlog of work that it had to do. And that's really why you monitor these two things, to keep an eye on whether there is like 100% busy and a massive backlog, or whether it's just 50% busy and there's no backlog. Like for people who are familiar with kind of sysadmin work, this is CPU utilization and run queue length would be saturation for the CPU. One of the, uh, the nice things about this, I don't know, I mean, I'm, I don't think of myself as a natural sysadmin, and so whenever I'm, I'm presented with these kind of problems of, oh, I have no idea what's wrong, I have to, I, I really like this kind of checkbox approach. You know, check all the things, hopefully that will give me some idea as to where I should look next. Like it's the unknown unknowns. Also, this is for a completely different set of use cases. The red method is for your microservice-oriented architecture and all your trendy things. And this is for hardware. This is for, well, virtual hardware, but hardware. This is for resources. This is, you know, if you had a separation between an infrastructure team and an apps team, this is the methodology your infrastructure team would use. So you end up, as I said, you end up with this kind of checklist. Go and look at CPU utilization, saturation errors, blah, blah, blah. Look through all the resources. Find the one that's causing a problem. Dive into that. One of the things you might notice here, like what does it mean for CPU errors or memory errors? Um, turns out I've spent the past couple of weeks kind of trying to actually codify what this means like in Grafana dashboards and Prometheus metrics. And it turns out to be quite challenging. Like uh, Linux doesn't export, I mean what does a CPU error even mean? So Linux doesn't export anything. I think you can get like CPU check counters and stuff, but Prometheus, as far as I can tell, doesn't have exports. This is where I kind of want a bit of feedback here. Like, if I'm talking absolute rubbish, tell me. Um, memory errors, like, m malloc on Linux, like, intentionally never fails unless you exhaust the virtual address space. Like, so what does memory errors even mean? You, again, like, you can use check codes, you can grep through dmessage for, like, oh, we recovered for some ECC error, but with most of us being on the cloud, is that anything we're actually ever explo exposed to? Um, I literally have a massive document where I've kind of gone through this. Hard disk errors is actually something I finally managed to find. There is a counter exposed in Sisyphus that exposes like actual I.O. errors, but I was really surprised to find I.O. stat doesn't expose these. Uh, and Prometheus doesn't scrape that counter, and it will do before I give this talk in KubeCon. Uh, disk capacity versus disk O. This is another one. Like I've never actually had an outage because we've been hammering our disks, but I have had so many outages because you filled them up. Um, and this method, this method kind of is a bit hazy between what does saturation, uh, what does utilization for a disk mean? Does it mean disk I/O? Does it mean capacity? Does it mean both? Um, network utilization. This is one. It's really hard to measure how busy a network card is because um, it can be really not busy and just saturating its link. So network utilization has been one of those ones where you kind of have to know a priori how much am I expecting in terms of bandwidth, and that's I'm not very satisfied by that answer. And internet interconnects is something that is massively overlooked by everyone. And luckily, as far as I mean, I'm just reading off the Brendan Gregg description of this, doesn't seem to be a problem. Actually, one of the companies I'm working with is having an interconnect problem is saturating its memory bus. But that's just fun. Um, but yeah, and, and really hard to monitor your interconnect bandwidth. Anyway, so demo time. This one should be a bit quicker. I didn't want to go through like how to monitor every single one of those like 12 different metrics because I mean, I'd be pulling my own eyes out by then. But I am just going to show you the dashboard I built and, and, and hopefully this, okay, cool. Thank you. 
So uh, the dashboard I've built is, I, I, I'm, oh, I need to change my resolution. I'm already there, Matt. Scaled. There we go. So this is the dashboard I've been building. It's, um, it's hosted on our Grafana, of course. Oh, I've logged out. Right then, Grafana, we'll go to Kubernetes resources. So this one is where I try and say utilization versus saturation for each of my resources. So CPU utilization, you should expect, is really relatively easy to measure. Um, how much of the time is the CPU busy? Prometheus, there's loads of blog posts about this. Prometheus has a really sophisticated way of monitoring this. Saturation, on the other hand, this is me trying to find a unitless way of expressing run queue length. So what I've done here is I've divided the run queue length by the number of CPUs in, in each machine, aggregated over a cluster that doesn't have the same amount of CPU in every machine, um, to kind of give you an idea of, of the level of saturation. So anything above 100 would be bad. I don't know whether this is particularly meaningful yet. <laughs> Come and talk to me afterwards if you think this is atrocious. Uh, memory utilization, relatively easy to measure. Again, like we ignore things like the page cache and so on. Uh, memory saturation. Oh, this one, this one was tough. Like, I've gone with um, the rate of paging, so the rate of paging in and out as, a, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a, like a, an indication of whether this is a problem or not. Not particularly happy with that. Like, I mean, I don't have a measure for error rate in CPU, uh, error rate on CPU or memory. Disk utilization, that one's easy. Really low on this cluster. Um, disk saturation is effectively a measure of the queue length, but Linux doesn't export this in a nice way, so with a bit of fudging. I mean, I've no idea why the saturation is like an order of magnitude higher than utilization um, when it's so low. Network utilization, this is obvious. I want One of the things I want to do is break this down by re, uh, transmit versus receive. Uh, sat, uh, saturation I've taken as resends, because I think that's kind of a nice indication of oversaturation. But, but I'm really not happy that these all kind of have different units, and you need to understand the units to really understand the graph. This goes against what I was getting at with the red method, where I don't need to understand what the service does. So suggestions welcome. And disk capacity, because it's kind of you know the ugly stepchild. Um, and then I've broken it down by node, which is, is, is technically challenging, but, um, but, but not particularly interesting to present. So we're going to spend a lot of time going through this. Now, actually, one of the things I did want to show you is how I did that. So one of, the, one of the best practices with Prometheus is you don't put unnecessary labels on times. Oh, I can, I'm going to talk now, but you can stay there. So one of the best practices with Prometheus is you don't like overload these time series with lots and lots of labels, because there's a reasonably high overhead with the indexing of these time series. And that's the real bottleneck with Prometheus. Um, so a lot of people would say, well, uh, what I'm going to do is uh, everything I scrape off this individual service, I'll just, I'll just tack on the node that it happens to run on, on onto that time series, because it makes my querying easier. But you shouldn't do that, I'm told. So I tried not to do that. And I tried to instead have used Prometheus's like join functionality. So most people don't realize that Prometheus can do joins. Like it's not an SQL database, but it can still do joins. Um, so I'm just going to, I'm not going to time. I'm not going to try and, uh, and, and type this. I'm just going to blah, blah, blah. I'm just going to show you the, met the functions I've used. So this here, this function here, will tell us, will give us a set of time series where the value is all one, and that's really important. Give us a set of, I'll, I'll make it a bit bigger because I can see people squinting. Give us a set of time series, which is effectively just a three tuple of the pod name, which is instance, the namespace that's pods in, and the node that pod is on. Okay, and it's all one. And people might be way ahead of me here. What I then do is, if I want to know what pod, or what node a particular metric came from, is I just multiply it by this special uh, vector. So I've given it a name so it's not so clunky. The name is somewhere in here. Oh, node. Here we go. So the name is node namespace instance cube pod info. So if I multiply that out by the thing I'm interested in, it will tell me the node it's on. So to give you another example of that, I will go for uh, one of the ones node. Balls. So if you go, for instance, the per node CPU load. This is quite a good one. Can you see that? 
what we've done is we've taken the per node CPU load, which is this average rate, blah, 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 blah. We've done a group left on namespace instance by that me method and grouped it all by node. And that gives us a, uh, let's, well, let's just show you what it gives us. It gives us per node CPU utilization. So I, I was really pleased with this, right? As you can probably tell. Um, but this is maybe getting a bit advanced. So, how long am I? Oh, I'm running out of time. I will wrap this up. Yeah, but I want a beer. So that's the use method with Prometheus. One of the things I'm going to do is make all of this open source, and therefore I need a really good name. And I'm thinking clumps, because it's like Kubernetes, Linux, use method, Prometheus. Can anyone come up with a better name? So anyway, um, use method. Brendan Gregg has an awesome website on this. I haven't listed any other references because this is the authoritative reference. There's loads of information. You should really go and read this. I've spent the last, well, few years studying his work, and it's just absolutely fantastic. So the four golden signals is something that Google came up with. It is not a sticker that you stick on the back of your phone to improve web, uh, mobile reception, which is what you get if you Google for it. Uh, it is, in fact, these four things, latency, traffic, errors, saturation. And you'll probably notice latency, traffic, and errors is exactly what the red method is. And there's a good reason behind that. It's because I worked at Google, and I was taught this, and I forgot the fourth one. Um, <laughs> it's, also, it's also like red's method doesn't really roll off the tongue as well as red method does. Um, it's also how full your service is. is like, how do I measure that? Turns out to be a real pain to measure that. But I've got a way, and that's what I want to show you. Um, one more time, switching between mirroring and changing my resolution. This is the last time, Matt. No, he's asleep. <laughs> do, do, do. Scaled, yes. So I'll go back to that incomprehensible. Um, uh, it wasn't in nodes, it was in services. Do I have this for service? Oh, no, this is. There we go. Right, found it. Wake up. So here we go. What we do is we do a similar trick to what we did before. We take the, uh, these are all recording rules just to simplify it, but we take the uh, pod container resource request. So in Kubernetes, you get to say, I expect this pod to use one CPU or two CPUs. So we take that, we take that expectation, like that requests, and there's another thing called limits. Um, and then we multiply it by the actual CPU usage, which is this, uh, oh crap, that's not doing that. That's doing something different. But that's effectively what we do. You get the message. I need to make that bit of the presentation a little bit slicker. We take the requests that the CP that a pod asks for, and we multiply it by its actual usage. And we'll go for my extensive notes. Maybe we will find the actual query I need. Yeah, try and read that. Uh, and there we go. And we put that in, and we see that it works, yes. So we can see um, which pods are using, like, close to the request that they're asking for, like, are close to saturation. You can see the production ingester is running at, you know, close to 80% utilization, which is great, right? Makes it cheap or slow. Um, and then there's a whole bunch of pods down here that are using nowhere near enough. So, three minutes to go. For the Four Golden Signals, read these two books. The SRE book is absolutely fantastic. I know the chap who wrote it, and he spent like two years of his life writing it. It's absolutely fantastic. This blog post came up in Googling today. I haven't read it. Uh, in summary, you have three methods. The red method for microservices, the use method for physical virtual resources, and the Four Golden Signals, which is kind of the, use, uh, the red method plus plus, if I was to you know, take ownership of something like that. Um, there are two other methods, it turns out, that people have already pointed out to me, method R and the TSA method, also by Brendan Gregg. Um, these slides will be online. All of these things are links. I haven't looked into them yet, and I kind of need to for credibility reasons before I give this talk in two weeks' time. Thank you very much. Any questions? <laughs> Is no questions a good sign or a bad sign? One question, thank you. <laughs> Big black thing.
Hello. Other side. Where are your handers? Other hand. There we go. Speak into the Oh, room. hi. There we go. Testing. Yes. A um, little bit new to Prometheus. Where, but I come from a, like a networking background where we used to collect lots of information about routers and switches and stuff like that. So you've got a whole series of monitoring products which have been developed over the past 20 odd years. Mm. Trying to map that to Prometheus. So um, what are you doing exactly? Are you keeping all your numbers on some big database? Or is it within those, because those microservices are really small and they don't do a great deal. They've got to transmit that information somewhere where, and you've got to do your analysis on it. How does yeah. it work? I don't have to repeat the question, do I? Good. So, um, yes, Prometheus is a central time series database. Uh, there's a new Prometheus 2.0 release that has a now a custom time series database, and it's super cool, and it's really efficient, and I don't have time to go into it. But yes, there is a central time series database. Um, Prometheus reaches out and scrapes all the services, so it's not a push-based service, it's a pull-based service. Um, network monitoring is one of the things, actually, where there's a slight chink in Prometheus's armor because it exports these like these counters, right, which only ever increment. And when you've got a really fast-running, like, 10-gig Ethernet card, it can overflow those counters really quickly. So that's, like, the one chink. But if you've got a massive microservice architecture of things only doing a few thousand QPS per service, per, per instance, you'll never have that problem. Um, otherwise, uh, you know, if you were to compare Prometheus to things like Graphite, are you familiar with Graphite? Yeah, so Graphite has this hierarchical scheme yeah. where you have like, you know, host dot service dot thing. Um, Prometheus kind of takes that and makes it non-hierarchical with this kind of multi-dimensional label space. Um, and that's really the big difference between Prometheus and Graphite is you can do these cross-cutting queries much easier. But is it, is it just another little microservice which is like monitoring all the rest? I mean, it's not a microservice. I mean, well, yeah, it's, it's reasonably big. But yes, the way I've deployed it with most of my users and customers is as another service inside their Kubernetes right. cluster. So it's not working as a like a kernel module or anything like no, that. No, no, no. It's all it's all white box. I kind of skipped over okay. this at the beginning, but it's all white box monitoring. So you have to ex you have to expose the metrics from the service you want. Okay. That being said, there's a whole series of uh, what we call exporters, and these are um, adapters, if you like, that kind of scrape. Uh, metrics from other systems and expose them in a Prometheus format. Well, the node exporter is the one I was mainly using here, and this scrapes the PROC and Sisyphus file system to expose metrics from the Linux kernel. So you can bring all the different hosts which are running all of the oh, yeah. services all together. And exactly, you and, and you, would, you would run one of these in your cluster, and Prometheus has a really sophisticated service discovery mechanism okay. where it can go and find things. Like, so it can go and talk to the EC2 API and list all your VMs and then go and talk to them and use tags to decide where to talk to. Or if you're Prometheus, uh, if you're Kubernetes, it will go and talk to the Kubernetes API server, list all the pods, services, endpoints, you name it. Um, if you're using console, it uses, it can do console service discovery, it can do DNS service discovery. It's got a really sophisticated service discovery line. Is it dragging huge amounts of data across your little... No, no, it's really space. relatively small because it's just counters. Yeah. Um, it kind of doesn't matter if you skip a scrape because yeah. you're losing accuracy, you're not losing, um, you're losing granularity, you're not losing accuracy, right? Okay. So it, will, it knows, if it's under pressure, it knows to back off cor correctly. Right, but well no, the level well of behaved. Load, <laughs> it's very well behaved. My Prometheus okay. is one, I mean, I came to Prometheus reasonably late, um, just before it, well, when it was like, you know, an early, pre-1.0, but an early version, and it's just one of the, a pleasure to work with. It's one of the best written pieces of software I've ever, ever worked on. I mainly worked on the remote read and write path for it. Yeah. And I've written a horizontally scalable distributed version of Prometheus that's also open source. Um, as kind of, and that's what this company here does. Oh, cool. Thank you very much. Thank you. I could talk about this forever, but yeah. we should all go for a beer. OK, we're not going to do all these questions, but we can go for the guy all the way at the back, because I want to see someone throw it that far. Oh, come on, oh, throw come it. On. I don't think that you um, So you said something in the beginning that it's important to see these dashboards consistent between services so that mm -hmm. somebody new to that would understand immediately at a glance what's happening. So how do you do that when you have like a microservice problem, maybe one or two microservices? Uh, how do you enforce that? Because you don't want to show each individual developer, hey, you added that new service at this dashboard uh, in this way. So how do you keep that consistent? How do you keep it consistent between different environments, staging, pod, dashboard? Yeah, so the question was, like, how do you make this actually like consistent and work? 
and like hope is not a strategy, which was hammered into us at Google. So you can't just like tell people this is the way they should do it and then expect them to do it. I found like building consistency over an engineering team is a really challenging topic that's well beyond the scope of this talk. Um, but the carrot approach works better for me. So generally I found like give them a good reason to do this. Like if you do it this way, I'll look after your service and I'll carry the pager. Tends to be a, like a really good motivator, but like t on a technical level, I, I kind of briefly showed you that middleware, um, you know, at, at, at Causal and at Weaveworks before, that middleware was embedded in all of our services. So to a, to a, 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 a you know, the end engineer's point of view, one line of code imports the middleware, wraps all their HTTP server, and they export metrics that keep the, the operations guys happy. Um, so make it easy for them, give them a carrot so that they want to do it. Uh, and generally, like, building that dashboard, I really want to make a way of automatically, like, tracing who talks to whom and then dynamically building that dashboard. I think that'd be a really good idea. I just haven't done it yet. Um, but yeah, hopefully that's, like, a partial answer. Right, all the way at the front. Oh, no, it's already here. Sorry. I'll throw it really far, I promise. Please. Um, <clears throat> so we... Um, we had a problem with our cluster where we couldn't schedule services even though it was empty because everybody was over-provisioning and they were requesting too much that we're using. Yep. So we created a dashboard exactly like yours with red and green, everybody who's not using yep. what they're asking for. Um, but we had to write a metrics exporter which said what you're requesting. What are you using? Cube state metrics. So there's two. There's the one I wrote, which is called Kubernetes exporter, which you shouldn't use. And then there's the one that the Kubernetes team wrote, mainly CoreOS and Fabian. Um, called Cube State Metrics. And that talks to the API and exposes whatever is being yeah. requested. Yeah, it does exactly what the third thing we now know of has written. But it talks to the API server, exposes yes. stuff, and it's really well curated and, and generally does the right thing. Don't worry, we'll teach ours and we'll never see the light of the world. So. Yeah, Cube State Metrics, or if you, if you don't like it for some reason, there's a thing in my GitHub that does it. But don't use that. There was one on your left. Oh, on your right, sorry. Down there, blue top. Last one. Make it good. Uh, okay, so um, you when you men when you monitor a service that has users, which is the one that are worth monitoring, uh, the the metric I guess is kind of you want to really keep an eye on is user impact. So how do you how can the methods that you described how how can you use those to kind of automate? Uh, insight into what is the user impact of, of any behavior in the system that you're seeing? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, I don't have a particularly good answer, to be brutally honest. We had a series of outages in my previous company where, as part of the post-mortem, we had to assess how many people did this affect. And generally, we didn't use that system. Right? One of the challenges I, I pointed to with Prometheus is you know, it's super cheap, it's super real-time, it's super easy to run but it really suffers from cardinality problems. So you, like one of the things you should never do, and this is like banged into anyone, it's in like the first page on Prometheus is, you should never put a user identifier in a label because the cardinality would just be too high. Um, so what we did instead is we used BigQuery. Like in every single request that ever went to our service was also stuck into BigQuery. And whenever we had to answer the question of, oh, we had a big outage, you know, what user do I have to go and phone up and, and apologize profusely to? We used BigQuery to answer that. Um, yeah, don't you mean we didn't use Prometheus to do that? But you know, on the other hand, like running that query in BigQuery was a lot more expensive. You couldn't, you know, it's not something you would build a dashboard that runs off, right? Um, yeah, does that answer your question? Uh, yeah, I mean, I guess the other question is kind of if you want to just uh, mod, like optimize your alerting for for user impact. Oh, I see, okay, wow, I completely misunderstood that. Um, yeah, if you want your, like, the nice thing about the red method is it points directly at alerts. So this, the, 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 the E and the D, the errors and the duration, are things you should alert on. You should alert if your proportion of errors is high, you know, and high might be 0.1% or 0.1% or, or whatever it might be. We, I think we have ours set to 0.1%, you know, and we literally, you know, that will wake me up if the errors going into the front end are more than 0.1%. And if your duration is high, you know, we monitor 99% of our latency, and I'm, I'm really impressed no alerts came up whilst I was watching this, because we've got a problem right now. Um, but we keep our 99% of our latency at our front end below 100 milliseconds, and currently it's wavering between 100 and 200, because um, we just onboarded some new people. But yeah, like, 
those two things, right? It's good problems, right? Um, those two things are things you should alert on, and that's how you make sure you get alerted quickly about problems that might impact users. Because at the end of the day, if I'm loading a website, I care it doesn't show me a 500, and I care it loads quickly. And they're the, the E and the D. And don't, don't alert on request rate. I mean, I think we've got an alert that says if the request rate drops below 10, then, you know, it's all on fire. But, uh, but like, whatever. Like, that one never fires. One of the duration or error rate always fires first. Yeah, because, I mean, if, if you have few requests and the high error rate, then you still have few yeah. infected users. Yeah, and you see some really interesting interplays, like when the request, when the duration, when things start getting really slow and the latency starts shooting up, your error rate like shoots down because you're not doing as many of those yeah. bad requests as often. This is why you need to monitor both, and so there, it's definitely not like a you know be all and end all. And, you know, like, I didn't talk about how you know if you've got some background processing pipeline, like the red method is not necessarily appropriate for that. Like you should use different methods. Like there is a fourth thing I want to talk about, but I need to trim something else out of the talk <laughs> to do that. Cool. Thank you. Very good. Thanks, guys.